In our work, we look at how narratives and gamification can be used to foster development of visualization literacy skills in young children between 11 to 13. We present our own instance of such a game, evaluate it in a between-subject study, and report results. We also detail key design considerations for future visualization-based games and highlight many opportunities for future work. Researchers use Argus to determine the sample size based on estimations. There exists a non-trivial dynamic relationship between those estimations and the statistical result and power. Argus allows researchers to explore scenarios of experiment design and effect sizes to better plan experiments. Atmospheric convection is one of the most important phenomena in metrology. It is responsible for cloud formation and storms. Yet, the measurements of the convective processes are expensive and scarce. In Isotrotter, we collaborate with a domain expert to build an empirical model of the atmospheric convection based on paragliding data. We design a novel visual parameter space analysis technique using isostructures in the parameter space to explain and validate the model. A short overview of the presentation for a simple pipeline for coherent grid maps. In the grid map, we transform an input map to a tile arrangement. However, current approaches do not perform well on complex maps such as the Netherlands. We propose a pipeline that generates high quality and coherent grid maps even for complex data using a simple pipeline. We study viscous and gravitational finger-like features in a carbon dioxide storage simulation applied for global warming mitigation in Earth science to support spatial exploration. Hello everyone, um, good afternoon. Welcome to the Dynamic Graph and Hypergraph session. My name is Jian Zhao. I'm a system professor at the University of Waterloo. I'm your session chair. So today we are going to have six amazing papers talking about graphs and dynamic graphs. So I'd like to give as much time as possible for the questions and discussions without further delay. Let's welcome the first paper titled is a visual analytics approach for ecosystem dynamics based on empirical dynamic modeling presented by hierarchy. 
Hello everyone, I'm Hiroaki Natsukawa of Kyoto University. I will talk about the visual analytic approach for ecosystem dynamics based on the empirical dynamic modeling. So here is today's agenda, and let's start with introduction. To extract the hidden rules governing the system, we measure the time series data. Then we try to clarify the mechanism by calculating the relationship among them. Let's imagine two time series X and Y that are measured by different sensors simultaneously, and if we assume the node represents a time series and the link represents a relationship between two time series, the relationship is depicted as a node link graph, and the simplest way to quantify the relationship is uh, calculating the correlation between the time series. In this way we can construct a network by quantifying the relationship among time series. But uh, is the relationship static or is it dynamic that changes over time? Natural systems are often complex and dynamic, so relationship between time series variables dynamically change in a non-linear manner. For example, every ecology, the competition between small desert mammals changes depending on the amount of rainfalls. So to achieve conservation of the ecosystem, which is mentioned in SDGs advocated by the United Nations, it is necessary to understand the interspecies relationship, which changes dynamically. But we have some challenges. First, it's difficult to accurately quantify this time varying relationship using a conventional linear approach. So one of the co-author, co Dale, and his group proposed a state-of-the-art method that measured the time varying relationship between time series. So this method is one element of the empirical dynamic modeling, EDM. EDM is a co correction of the method to study systems using an attractor reconstructed from time series data based on a non-linear state space reconstruction. I'll explain the principle of EDM later, but uh, in the function of EDM, time varying interaction can be calculated using the measured time series data. And EDM has been used in recent ecological research. A core strength of EDM is that system dynamics inferred from empirical evidence, so that is empirical from data. A fundamental weakness can be the overwhelming task of the interpreting result and the identifying inter-system drivers. The those tasks involve examining not only the individual relationship between species, but also the environmental factor under which relationships are observed. So in, uh, in order to overcome the weakness of EDM, we investigate integrating EDM with the visualization technique that can help analyze the behavior of the system. So our contribution is as follows. So first, we define the nurse task for visual analytic approach in close with collaboration with researchers in ecology. And then we develop the visualization system that integrates EDM with the visual analytics. And to demonstrate the usefulness of our proposed system with case studies. I'll move on to the rated work. There are a lot of rated work about uh, visual analytics for dynamic graphs. So interactive and linked view not only the enables the user to filter the dynamic graph, but also enables the user to reduce the data to manageable size. And what's proposed in those papers are dimensional reduction method can be used to extract the global feature of the dynamic graph. And I'll skip the detail about that there are various visualization and interaction techniques to support the phenomenological analysis of dynamic graph. Here we do not aim to propose another visualization technique, but uh, what distinguishes from the other method for analyzing dynamic graph is that the explicit reference to an underlying attractor and in particular the requirement, requirement that the multivariate subspace representation is valid. So next I'll explain the principles of ADM. So EDM is an equation-free mechanistic modeling approach based on the dynamic system. And now we can see the three time series X and Y and Z, and we are taking the time series and projecting them into the three-dimensional state space to reconstruct the manifold. And uh, this animation illustrates the Lorentz attractor, which is an example of the coupled dynamics system. And the correction of these trajectories empirically describes how variables are related to each other in time. So EDM uses the topological characteristic of reconstructed manifold to determine the complexity of the system and to determine the causal variables and to track the time varying interactions. So in this study we used EDM to track the time varying interactions. So here we can observe th that the two points on the hypothetical attractor point P and Q zooming in on a small neighborhood of these two points show that the interaction between X1 and the other variables are almost linear. The surface at the P has a positive slope in the X3 direction 
Conversely, the surface at Q has a negative slope in the x3 direction, so the partial derivative del x3 and del x1 corresponding to this slope define the interaction strings for the system state at point P and point Q. And in EDM, these interaction strings are quantified along its attractor by the multivariate S map. The multivariate S map is a locally weighted multivariate linear regression method and calculates a local linear model C at each time point on the attractor by the using singular value decomposition. And this coefficient of the local linear model C represents the interaction strings between variables. So this is the principle to track the time varying interaction in EDM. So next I move on to the visual analytic approach. So our first goal is to list the analysis task for analyzing, interpreting the ecosystem dynamics from EDM results. So to date, the core results published utilizing EDM have a general results describing what kind of interaction between species and what and under what condition by using the basic visualization such as the stata plots. So this is very sound approach for doing environmental data science, but also does not address the potential for vision an analytics. So after multiple round of discussion with co-authors and domain scientists, we derived the following four analysis tasks that our system should provide. So analysis task one is confirming EDM result, and 82 is identifying states from the dynamic graph, 83 understanding and on identified states and 84 visualizing and understanding of transition between states. So we designed the visual analytics system based on these requirements. So here is the workflow of our visual analytics system and the first step is the calculation of the dynamic network by the EDM. In this step, the interaction among the time series are quantified by the EDM, so enabling the construction of the dynamic network. In the subsequent step, the snapshot of the constructed dynamic network are vectorized as shown here. And after the vectorization, the information is considered to be the high dimensional point and that is mapped to the two dimension using the dimensional induction methods such as the PCA, isomap, TSNA, etc. And the position of the 2D mapping provides an insight about the evolution of the network. And so the goal to use a dimensional reduction plot is the identification of the system states that is represented by the cluster by a similar network snapshot. And in the next step, we introduce a blush link visualization, such as a 2D projection, scatter plots among variables, time series plot, and graph diagram. And in this phase, visual analytics system supports understanding of the identified states. So in the final step, we carried out uh, annotation and summarization using the results of blush link visualization. And once a point group is selected by the lasso selection, the point group is aggregated into the node in the state transition graph as shown here and the directed edge is given between the SDG nodes based on the calculated number of the transition and in addition if the user wants to e examine the changes in SDGs as SDG is constructed for each interval by a sliding window resulting in the time varying SDGs as shown here. Okay, and we developed that GUI with multiple views as a plot type. In the EDM view it enables us to confirm the input and output in EDM calculation. So inputs are time series data and outputs are time varying interaction. And in the dynamical network view, it has 2D mapping and state transition graph. And we can select the dimension reduction algorithm to use and select the data set to use. Then we can identify the point group of the 2D mapping using the lasso selection. Okay. And once the point group is selected, STG is created here. And in the detail view, it enables to explore the relationship between nodes and links. And by using this view, that we can check the characteristics of the selected point group. And the next setting view enables us to specify parameter for EDM calculation. And this tool allows the user to visually analyze the dynamic graph. So here we introduce a second use case. And we applied our proposed method to the marine mesocosm dataset, including calanoid copepers and the lotifers that are isolated from the Baltic Sea, and we had a time series of abundance of such species. And we focus on the Calanoid and Lotifer, and their two main play, Nano and Pico, as model in this figure. Then we quantify the varying interaction strengths of ecosystem components on the uh, Calanoid and Lotifer. The question is, what characteristic do interspecies relationships have? So as a result of EDM calculation, interaction between the carinoid and nano are always positive, as shown in red, 
and the whereas the interaction between the Carano and the Lotifer are always negative, as shown in blue. And this is a 2D mapping of dynamic graph. And we can identify the four point group using this linked visualization. And four point group S1, S2, S3, S4 are annotated as a carotenoid dominant, nano high competition low, lotifer dominant, and pico high carotenoid dominant, respectively. And the grouping S3 and S4 were newly found using our tools. Okay. And in addition, we classified the 2D mapping points into the four groups to construct the state transition graph like this and we can see the dominant feature of the state transition between the car and lot and both car dominant state and lot dominant state can transition into the leftmost state showing the abundance nano and but the transition from the lot dominant to pico high car dominant does not exist in the graph this is because the pico that is small plankton are mainly eaten by loto that is a small zooplankton on the other hand, the nano, that is a larger plankton, are eaten by the cow, that is a larger zooplankton. These size differences can cause an asymmetric transition in terms of the pico. And this dynamic SDG visually explains why the system alternates between the two predator play cycles. If pico are abundant, the lot population will increase and the suppressed pico. So nano can gain a competitive advantage instead of the pico, as shown in the second graph, and this will benefit cow, which lies in the abundance and subsequently suppress nano. So this gives new opportunity for pico back again and to see the available resources. So this too make these dynamics visible through the detection, annotation, and visual summarization of the ecosystem dynamics. So in this way, we can reach a mechanistic understanding of the ecosystem dynamics. Okay, here I'd like to discuss new insight found in the use cases and how the visual and interaction design of the system made these discoveries possible. So in the use case, the two revealed new ecosystem state features and the new asymmetric transition between identified groups. As seen in dated work using EDM, the scalar plot and time series plot are often used to interpret the result of the EDM. But there is a limit to the number of the groups that can be found in the scatter plot alone. So integrating the snapshot to points approach with the EDM results allowed us to recognize more global features of the dynamic graph and to identify the greater variety of states. And as for the transition between groups, the more time series point <coughs> the more snapshots are generated and it's difficult to understand the de that direction and the amount of the transition only by looking at the trajectory. So we presented them as a node link graph that are easy to comprehend intuitively that so it enables understanding of the asymmetry of the play predator structure. So this prototype has a limitation about the scalability and it still provides only fundamental visual representation of the SDG. So new visualization and computational idea could be useful to overcome these limitations. And for the future work, the, we try to apply this tool to the other data set in the field of the neuroscience and oceanography. So we propose a workflow that integrates EDM with interactive visual analytics and we expect our proposed method will be useful not only in the field of the ecology but also in many other diverse fields. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Haruki, for the amazing talk. Um, the EDM model seems to be very useful in many applications. So um, while we're waiting the question coming up from the Discord channel, I'm going to ask you a question. So could you elaborate a little bit more on the uh, application domains? Like, is this model generalizable to every applications or it actually has some limitations? Uh, sorry, could, could you repeat the question, the last part? Uh, is this model having mm -hmm. any um, limitations in applying to ah, different yeah. application domains? 
Yeah, so the yeah, EDM has uh, remi uh, limitation, but, and uh, the EDM is a powerful method that are used in the field of ecology. But uh, in terms of the visualization, the main limitation is uh, a, some graphical user interface and the visual analytic approach to support EDM analysis have not been available so far. So, mm -hmm. and uh, tasks for understanding the global local feature of the EDM results and its dynamics were not organized. So uh, the, it's a motivation that uh, we carried out this study in collaboration with the uh, expert of EDM and ecology. Mm -hmm. Another question um, is, I see there is some overplotting in your visualization. Do mm -hmm. you have any uh, thoughts on that? Can you address that issue in the future versions? Uh, so, a uh, so Sorry, I see the scatter plot. Mm -hmm. uh, the scatter plot is actually you, you have a lot of points overlap with yeah. each other. Yes. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that to to reduce the uh, mm -hmm. overplotting? I uh, yeah. So yeah, currently we use a, a simple basic visualization, but uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, I think uh, there are several directions for future work. So some, some techniques supporting a series of analysis and exploration can be improved by the, some incorporating automatic clustering algorithm into the current workflow. And uh, yeah, we definitely have the several directions for the future work to uh, improve the visualization part, yeah. Cool, yeah. So um, thanks very much for answering the questions. Uh, if uh, I suggest the audience to type in the Discord channel to ask questions, and if you have further questions, you can always direct message uh, the others or just uh, type a question on, uh, on the Discord channel. So let's move on to the next paper. Um, the next paper is titled with multi-scale snapshots, visual analysis temporal summaries in dynamic graphs. So let's see how this multi-scale snapshot can address some kind of scalability issues in dynamic graph realization. This paper will be presented by Erin as welcome. Welcome to the presentation of multi-scale snapshots, a visual analytics approach to explore temporal summaries in dynamic graphs. Let me start by giving you some background information. A dynamic graph models changing relationships between entities over time. Real-world examples are, for instance, biological, social, or neural networks. In such networks, for instance in social networks, analysts are usually interested in identifying important temporal intervals and their underlying changing structural properties, such as trends, outliers or reoccurring temporal states. In this work, we tackle this problem and present a visual analytics approach to semi-automatically analyze similar temporal summaries to explore the structural and temporal properties of dynamic graphs at multiple temporal scales. Let us quickly recap related work. Previous visualization techniques for dynamic graphs can be categorized into animation, timeline, and hybrid visualizations. In our work, we also compare a selection of recent work to highlight that a significant number of graph visualizations do not scale to a large number of nodes, edges, and timestamps at the same time. There are several reasons for this. The size and complexity of the data poses various challenges as there is a trade-off between displaying the detailed graph structure for each time step and presenting the evolving properties over time. Therefore, previous approaches often incorporate temporal abstraction methods, for instance temporal aggregation or dimensionality reduction to provide an overview of higher level structures over time. However, the usefulness of such abstraction methods, for instance temporal aggregation, depends on many factors. For example, a fine-grained temporal aggregation in large-scale dynamic graphs results in various intervals with little information unable to provide an overview. 
In contrast, coarse scale aggregation produces only a few intervals which may contain a high variance. Finding the appropriate level of abstraction is a non-trivial task. We propose multi-scale snapshots, a visual analytics approach to analyze temporal summaries of dynamic graphs at multiple temporal scales. The approach consists of three main steps. First, we uniformly partition the temporal dimension of the dynamic graph at different temporal scales with overlapping intervals. We apply different summarization methods to each interval to reduce the sequence of the graph to a summary of the period. For example, we unify all nodes and edges of a period into a supergraph. We utilize multiple summarization methods to generate diverse representations of the generated temporal intervals, as there is no single abstraction method able to encode all evolving properties of a dynamic graph. The multi-scale partitioning length can be modified to the application domain, for example, interval lengths of a year, quarter, month or week. Overall, the first step results in a hierarchy of graph summaries at different temporal granularities. We call all the computer graph summaries of an interval a snapshot. In the second step, we apply unsupervised graph learning methods to embed all summary graphs of all periods into a low-dimensional space. We employ these methods as they do not require any feature engineering, they are task agnostic and data-driven, and are able to capture structural equivalence in the latent space. The embeddings can be furthermore pre-computed and also are typically small enough to fit into main memory. The main goal of these unsupervised learning methods, for example graph to vec is to model the similarities between the different multi-scale temporal summaries and to reduce the complex data characteristics of the evolving graph to simple vectors. In the first step, we organize the temporal snapshots in a multi-scale visualization and use the graph embeddings for analytical tasks, for example for a similarity search. The visualization itself displays the summaries from the snapshots from coarse to fine-grained representations and uses juxtaposed small multiples and combinations with different visual metaphors, for example node link diagrams or adjacency matrices. In the following we will describe the implemented prototype of our work and its two primary visual components. The displayed data is the Reddit dataset in which each node is a subreddit and the edges are hyperlinks between the subreddits. Each edge has either a positive or negative sentiment. The first component is the multi-scale snapshot visualization which consists of three parts. A toolbar that allows us to apply different methods, for instance to search and filter for nodes, in this case for subreddits. A time context bar on the top that shows which periods of the dynamic graphs are visualized. And a level context bar on the right allows us to add and remove levels of temporal granularity. The stacked snapshot view displays and orders the snapshot from coarse to fine granular temporal scales and facilitates horizontal and vertical temporal navigation. A snapshot view is a small multiple which combines different visual metaphors in a consistent interface to increase the task coverage. We can also add more snapshot views to each level of temporal granularity. To avoid overlaying the display space, we limit the number of visualized levels and snapshot views. For example, by abstracting whole levels of temporal aggregation. Abstracted snapshot views are displayed as small rectangles without any visual representation. The second primary visual component of our prototype is the query interface, which allows to apply nearest neighbor queries to search for similar summary graphs over time. The interface displays each level as a timeline and encodes via color already visualized and investigated snapshots. The nearest neighbor query results are displayed as dots on the timeline, and the distance between the underlying graph embeddings is mapped to the opacity of the dot. The timelines of different temporal granularity can be ordered, for example by the distance of the graph embeddings. The results can be selected and then displayed in the multi-scale snapshot visualization which overall allows us to search for similar temporal states in the dynamic graph. Next, we will shortly introduce the functionalities of the snapshot view. Each snapshot view allows visualizing the different summary graphs, for example the union, intersection or disjoint graph. The snapshot view allows us to present derived structural properties as the background color and modify visual mappings, for example to map the node degree of each subreddit to the node size. Further, each snapshot view allows to depict data using four kinds of visual metaphors, a static or animated node link diagram, an adjacency matrix with different reordering strategies, and a time series of extracted graph metrics, for example, to visually analyze the graph density over time. In the following, we will elaborate the presented user scenario of our paper. 
we show how multi-scale snapshots enables us to discover structural and temporal changes during the 2016 US presidential elections. The prototype displays per default the whole dynamic graph as a clustered supergraph which allows us to investigate higher level structures, for instance clusters of subreddits. We start by entering the dates of the election read and the prototype automatically returns the best fitting period. The prototype displays the election week as a cluster supergraph and we map the size of the cluster of subreddits to the node size to discover large groups of subreddits. We then select and filter all political subreddits of the election week. We assume that the political subreddits which have been active during the election week were also actively participating in the political discussion of the whole 2016 US presidential election. We then use the union graph of the election week for a similarity search. We discover that the nearest neighbors are on the second and third level, which means that these rather short snapshots include similar hyperlinks that were also posted between subreddits during the election week. We select and visualize these summary graphs. We remove the empty views as they are probably false positives. During the vision analysis we discover that the third level summary graph includes a displayed snapshot of the second level. This is surprising as it means that the low-level snapshot seems to be decisive for the similarity search results as the disjoint graphs includes many similar political subreddits to the ones during the election week. We therefore select this disjoint graph again for a similarity search. We expect that the similarity search will return more political events as the low-level graph embedding contains mainly linked political subreddits. The resulting similar snapshots have a duration from 1 to 3 days, which probably maps to the news coverage scheme of different political events. We select these snapshots of varying lengths. In our paper we also compare the detected snapshots to the real-world historic ground truth of news coverage schemes to validate our results. Many of the detected events can be mapped to political events such as broadcasted political debates or scandals. Overall, the user scenario describes how we can use multi-scale snapshots to discover similar temporal summaries and provide an overview of the evolving data. The approach enables us to discover similar temporal summaries with different durations. For example, we were able to relate most snapshots to real-world political events such as the Hillary Clinton email affairs and the leaked tape of Donald Trump. We also detected some events which we could not directly relate to political events. These events are probably general political discussions initiated by Reddit users or targeted distributions of news from public relations groups or political bots. Overall, the user scenario highlights how the approach can be used to semi-automatically search for similar temporal states in a real-world dynamic graph. Furthermore, we quantitatively evaluated the similarity search of the graph embeddings with synthetic and real-world datasets. The similarity search in this case was a 5 nearest neighbor search to a specific graph or interval of graphs. We calculated a ground truth of similarity for the k nearest neighbor search by computing the distance between the input and all other graphs using an adjacency-based similarity score. As a baseline model, we used three unsupervised graph learning methods on the different datasets with and without the multi-scale temporal modeling. On each dataset, the experiment was repeated five times for window queries of different lengths. The results of the evaluation indicate an improved accuracy on window queries on the listed real-world datasets. An explanation for this can be the fact that there is a drastic difference between the topology of the synthetic and real-world datasets. As the synthetically generated datasets have a quite high density, while in contrast to this, the real-world datasets are much more sparse. For more details on the quantitative evaluation, we refer to the paper. Our approach also has some limitations. The memory and time complexity for the computation of the graph summaries is O of log, the number of time steps, times, the number of nodes, plus the number of links. Furthermore, displaying multiple temporal scales poses new user-related aesthetic challenges. For example, for the mental map of a user or temporal aliases, which means that specific snapshots can be mistaken for other periods in time. The display space also limits the visual scalability and readability of snapshots views, since they depend on the number of presented snapshots. The usage of user guidance in combination with more automatic analysis methods can help users to find interesting initial snapshots and to further steer the users towards a useful combination of data and visual transformations. For example, by drilling down into temporal intervals using subqueries. To sum it up, in this work we presented multi-scale snapshots, a vision analytics approach to provide an overview of a dynamic graph at multiple temporal scales. The approach consists of three steps, creating multi-scale temporal summaries, applying graph embeddings and the semi-automatic visual analysis. 
The combination of these steps lets us visually explore how temporal and structural properties affect the overall dynamic graph. The code for the prototype implementation of multi-scale snapshots is available online. And with that I want to thank all of my co-authors and the reviewers for their extensive feedback. Very nice work, Iren. So, Thanks. well, uh, the audience asking a question on the uh, Discord channel. I have a question. So, in your uh, system, you have uh, multiple abstracting levels. Like, how can a user keep an overview of the, all those different levels? Um, so basically, we aim to do this with these context bars. So we have like a context bar for the temporal dimension. So while you explore the data set, uh, you see where you are in the temporal dimension. And also on the other side, we have this level context bar where you always see um, which level of granularity is now displayed. So this is like aiming to give like the user an overview where he is currently in this temporal aggregations. Cool. Here's a question from the Discord channel. So have you thought about how this work can be applied to online dynamic graph visualizations? Um, yeah, that's like a good question. I never thought about that problem as these uh, graph embeddings are at least, uh, they are quite slow and computationally, they require quite some uh, like computation time and memory also. Uh, therefore, uh, I'm not sure how this could be applied even to like the online scenario uh, as like um, we are trying to like uh, analyze like larger uh, time steps of dynamic graphs at the same time. So I'm not sure if there are any graph embeddings that compute uh, graph embeddings online uh, currently. Probably there are. Thanks. So here's another question from the audience. So the system seems very powerful, but quite complex. Have you given it to any analyst outside your group? Like what kind of usability issues have you identified? Um, yeah, so the usability of the tool, um, we didn't evaluate that with like currently with uh, different persons or like, uh, like analysts in general. Um, yeah, the system is quite complex and we are planning to extend it with uh, various um, uh, approaches that uh, at least user guidance approach that would help to guide a user towards interesting patterns. But yes, usability is really, the system is quite complex here in this case, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And another question pop out. So uh, I just read it. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas on uh, integrate different temporal resolutions on the same timeline instead of uh, um, putting the graphs below and above each other? Um, yeah, we did not really think about that integrating it into like um, one level, but I think that would be quite possible to have that, uh, to have like these juxtaposed small multiples in one row. Um, so probably this could be done by a temporal clustering or like at least uh, trying to uh, cluster the embeddings that we have over time uh, and find like suitable clusters there, which could be used to group them and stack them also. Cool. Yeah. There are also suggestions from the uh, Discord channel that uh, there are some online embedding algorithms can check up, uh, see uh, Jimmy and Joe's work. So maybe you can check it later. So well done, very nice work. So our next paper is, um, the effectiveness of interactive visualization techniques for time navigation of dynamic, dynamic graphs on large displays. So we have a large networks and now we want large displays. And this paper will be presented by Alexander. Hello, my name is Alex and I'm from Swansea University. I'm here to present our work, which was an experiment to evaluate interactive visual time navigation techniques for dynamic graphs on large displays. 
First, we need to define a dynamic network. A dynamic network is a network which has some change in structure over time. This means that nodes and edges in the graph can be added or removed as the graph progresses. A good example of this is a friendship network. You might begin as a friend of person A, but then as time progresses you might make another friend, person B, and lose your friendship with person A. Dynamic network data is increasingly available and is applicable across a variety of domains, including, but not limited to, transport efficiency, contagion effects within social networks, and modelling disease spread in an epidemiological context, something which is particularly relevant at the moment. Dynamic networks can be large in size, long in time, or both. Our focus is on long in time dynamic networks. These networks span a large period of time, but are not necessarily large in terms of numbers of nodes and edges. For example, the temporal component could span one year, but there may only be a handful of events per day which are recorded at the precision of one second. Now dynamic networks are pretty hard to visualise anyway, but adding a long in time component adds complexity. One of the pressing issues with this type of network is what the best way is to navigate in time. The most common ways of visualising a dynamic network are animation and small multiples. Animation steps through the graph as though it's a movie, playing the frames in order. For some animation interfaces, it is possible to step back and forth in time as well as playing the graph as a single movie. The principal drawback of animation is that all the temporal information is not displayed simultaneously and that the user generally needs to interact with the system to show certain periods of time, relying heavily on memory for moments not displayed on screen. Small multiples, however, treats the graph as a comic, and displays the graph at each time step in a panel. For small multiples representations, the graph is normally binned into uniform periods of time, like an hour or a day. We call this time binning time slicing, and the results are called time slices. However, when many time points need to be visualised simultaneously, as in long in time dynamic data. Small multiples can quickly run out of screen space, which then relies on user memory for comparing representations that cannot be on the screen at the same time. Small multiples is fine for when you need to compare points that are near in time and therefore are physically close in the representation, but can make it challenging to compare points that are far apart in time. To address some of the scalability problems associated with small multiples, we introduced a hybrid system that we call interactive time slicing. The system is built around the idea of comparing non-adjacent points and not the preservation of the order of time slices as small multiples does. It also allows for the comparison of non-uniform, user-defined time slices. For example, you could compare a time slice of one day to a time slice of one hour if your use case required it. However, this interface incurs an interaction cost in creating time slices, and we don't know how this will impact efficiency or effectiveness. We need to understand how this performs for dynamic graphs when compared to animation and small multiples. Previous experiments with dynamic graphs have primarily focused on comparing animation and small multiples. These experiments have used a variety of graphs and tested a number of tasks. Findings are generally that small multiples is faster than animation, with no significant difference in error rate. However, existing experiments don't look at long-in-time networks, and no one has previously tested interactive time slicing. To address this gap, we carried out a study to compare the performance of interactive time slicing, small multiples, and animation for long in time dynamic network data. After building the interactive time slicing interface, we had some high level questions. Number one, which interface is better in terms of completion time and accuracy? Number two, is one interface better across multiple task types or is performance dependent on task? And number three, is interface performance impacted by the distance between time points to be compared? To help answer our research questions, we first developed our remaining experimental interfaces. To make this a fair experiment, we required the interfaces to be as similar to each other as possible, with time navigation and selection being the primary differences between them. Interface 1 was a small multiples interface. It has a timeline at the top, and time slices represented as subsequent node link diagrams below. Time navigation in this interface is by moving the scroll bar at the bottom, or by touching and dragging on the grey window on the timeline. The grey window on the timeline shows the user their current position in time. Interface 2 is interactive animation. To select a time range to animate, the user touches and drags directly on the timeline. The left hand node link window is automatically created and was made to facilitate answer entry. Further details of this design choice are available in our paper. The central node link window initially shows the entire time period as a single flattened graph. The user navigates in time by touching and dragging over the small timeline at the bottom of this window. Time position is shown by a line which follows the user's touch. 
And finally, interactive time slicing. The user touches and drags on the main timeline, similar to animation, to define a time slice. They then do the same for the next time slice. Time slices can be moved or resized by the user. Interactive time slicing supports up to four simultaneous time slices. We defined three task types for this study. We treat each task as its own individual experiment. We believe that the three task types selected are representative of the tasks that are commonly performed on dynamic network graphs. Task 1 involves looking at a change in graph structure at separate points of time. This is an example of the task being completed with the interactive time slicing interface. Participants were shown where the time slices of interest were on the graph. On the timeline, participants had to touch and drag to select edges in the first left time slice that weren't present in the second right time slice. Task 2 required looking at the change in graph structure over a continuous time period. Participants were shown two lines on the main timeline which represented the start and end of the required time period. They had to identify which time slice in the given range had the largest cluster of purple nodes. Using the small multiples interface, as shown here, they simply had to scroll back and forth. Answer entry was via a button to switch into answer entry mode and then users dragged a time window to the correct time slice. Task 3 is similar to task 1 in that participants were given several separate time points and asked to compare between them. This video shows the task being completed with the interactive animation interface. In this case, participants were asked to only focus on one node, which was coloured hot pink, and to identify in which time slice the node was the smallest. There was a radical size difference with the target node being three times smaller than normal, so participants did not need to spend a lot of time on comparison. The graph data that we used was based on an Instagram network, with all node and edge attributes apart from posting time removed. We also carried out some filtering to reduce the network size. Participants were informed that the data was from Instagram. The graph covered 30 days, with edges given as atomic timestamps. A single drawing of the dynamic network was computed to control across conditions. Details of this are available in the paper. This was a within subjects experiment with three tasks where we treat each task as its own experiment. Each experiment made use of our three interfaces and also tested two time differences, near in time and far in time. 24 participants successfully completed the experiment and the experiment was carried out using an 84 inch touchscreen wall mounted display. We use this table to summarize our results as we progress through them. For a quick refresher, experiment one involved comparing the graph structure at two separate points of time. Here it is being completed with the interactive time slicing interface. Users selected edges in the left hand time slice that weren't present in the right hand time slice. Before we get into results, I'll just explain the figures. The top figure is for the near in time condition and the bottom figure is for far in time. Each row represents an interface and all figures have the interfaces in the same order. The circle represents the mean, the square the median, and the lines are our 95% confidence intervals. For experiment one, we can see that interactive time slicing is significantly faster than animation or small multiples for both the near and far in time conditions. The interaction cost of interactive time slicing is offset for comparing distant points in time. As well as being faster, interactive time slicing is also more accurate than animation or small multiples for this task type. Interactive time slicing is able to support the simultaneous analysis of multiple points in time. Neither animation or small multiples are a good choice of interface for this task type, regardless of the distance between the points in time. Both perform particularly poorly for temporally distant points. Interactive time slicing, however, performs well in terms of accuracy and speed for both time distances. For experiment two, we asked participants to identify a change in graph structure over a continuous time period. More specifically, they had to find the time slice with the densest cluster of purple nodes within a given time period. This video shows the experiment being completed with our small multiples interface. When the time range is small, animation is significantly slower than our other interfaces. Small multiples is actually faster for this task where the time range is large. This shows the higher interaction cost for interactive time slicing when needing to compare time slices within a time range. We see no significant differences in error rate for this experiment, meaning that all of our interfaces are accurate and usable for this task. Due to there being no difference in error rate for this experiment, we focus instead on the completion time for these ratings. Animation is by far the slowest interface for the near-in-time condition, but isn't the slowest for far-in-time. 
Small multiples clearly outperforms both interactive time slicing and animation for both near in time and far in time. The performance of interactive time slicing is okay for the near condition, but very poor for the far in time condition. There is an interaction cost with this interface and a number of participants were very frustrated completing the task as they suffered from several fat finger type interaction problems while trying to move and resize time slices. Finally, experiment 3 required participants to identify time slice from a given set where a pink node was its smallest size. This video shows the task being completed with the animation interface. In line with the previous experiments, animation had the slowest performance for both near and far conditions. Interactive time slicing outperforms small multiples for both near and far, though only significantly for the near condition. There is less demand on the participant's memory for this task when compared to experiment 1, i.e. much less scrolling back and forth for comparison is needed, which explains the more reasonable performance for small multiples. In line with experiment 2, there is no significant difference in error rate across the conditions. This means that all interfaces were accurate and usable for this task. Animation is the slowest for both time conditions of this experiment. We hypothesize this is due to participants needing to scroll through the time slices that they don't care about and that aren't part of the task, introducing an interaction cost, and also due to the target node not always being on screen, incurring a small memory cost. Small multiples is better for comparison within contiguous time intervals, and interactive time slicing demonstrates its clear strength for tasks re that require comparing time points that are separate in time, regardless of the separation distance. Our experiment has shown that interactive time slicing is able to facilitate navigation through time to compare points that are temporally distant. We can see from the results of experiment 1 that comparing things that aren't on screen at the same time, as in this video showing the small multiples interface, leads to a large memory cost and incurs time and accuracy penalties. This video has been sped up dub to double time to save us the pain of watching how slow this interface is for this task. Interactive time slicing addresses this by allowing the comparison of points regardless of their position in time. Across all experiments, though primarily in experience experiment 2, some of our participants became greatly frustrated with the interactive time slicing interface due to what we refer to as the fat finger problem. When participants would try to move or resize a previously defined time slice, they would frequently accidentally touch the edge of a different time slice, triggering a move or resizing of the non-target time slice. This non-target time slice would then have to be returned to its previous state before the participant could continue. This was a particular problem in experiment 2, as time slices were placed one after another on the timeline, as in this image. We believe this problem was exacerbated by the non-precise nature of a touchscreen wall display. If you're reaching up to touch something, you can't guarantee that you're going to get exactly the right object if there's only a small margin of error. One way to fix this could involve attaching the resize handles to only the top or bottom half of a time slice, or having the handles alternate which half they're attached to if a time slice is close to another. We also intend to carry out this experiment on a desktop display using a mouse to see if the fat finger problem either goes away completely or is greatly reduced. Supporting previous work, we also find that animation was generally outperformed by other interfaces. We believe that some modified style of interactive time slicing might be worth considering as a feature of interfaces that deal with dynamic network visualization. A participant commented that his ideal interface would be small multiples where he could collapse time slices that he didn't care to see, a feature that would potentially make small multiples more on par with interactive time slicing for the comparison of separate time points while still ensuring that small multiples were suitable for tasks involving comparison within contiguous time intervals. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this research. Are there any questions? Thanks, Alexander, for the great talk. So there's already a question from the audience. So I just read it out. Could you please explain Hi. a little bit about what you mean by each task was treated as different experiments? Hello. For example, different Hello. participants? Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. No, so every participant did every experiment. Um, they all did experiment one, then two, then three in that order. Hi. 
Um, when we say we treat them as separate experiments, what we mean is we don't really compare between them. So we didn't do statistical analysis between, uh, between the three experiments. We treated them as individuals. Cool. Hope that clarifies things. So I have an additional question. Do you think, uh, what is the generalizability of the study results? Do you think it's generalizable for multiple displays? Mm, that's a really good question, actually. So um, I do think it should be generalizable across multiple displays. Obviously, the more space you have, the less of the problem small multiples becomes with scrolling back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, but even so, having the big distance between them, when people are blinking and moving their heads, that there's still a disruption in memory going on. Um, but it would be great to test across like three 8K displays. <laughs> cool. Thanks very much. Um, so let's move on and we will switch gear to online dynamic networks. So the next paper is Staged Animation Strategies for Online Dynamic Networks, presented by Tariq. Hi, everyone. I'm Tark. I'm going to be talking about our work, Stage Animation Strategies for Online Dynamic Networks. This work was done with Shilpika, Sintil, and my advisor, Kwan Lu Ma, from the University of Davis, California, Video Lab. Within the domain of network analysis and visualization, there's a growing interest in visualizing dynamic networks, networks that change over time. Though there are many methods to do so, animation is widely recognized as a viable option to cha show changes to these types of networks. However, most techniques introduced to visualizing temporal changes in a network are demonstrated on offline dynamic networks where data is collected and processed offline. Such techniques take advantage of knowing future states of the network and scale their representation and stage any animation appropriately. Visualizing online dynamic network is a more challenging problem as it is not possible to predict the future state or the rate of the flow of data. It might not be even feasible to identify what behaviors to look for, especially if it was never seen before. Though algorithms are powerful methods to capture certain behavior, these behaviors first need to be recognized before an appropriate algorithm can be devised. But in mission critical situations, humans are the most practical solution for new and unexpected behavior. For example, monitoring CCT footage in real time, individuals will be looking for threatening and suspicious events, something in an algorithm would have a difficult time. In network visualization, analogies can be drawn from launching a new product or computer security monitoring, for an example. Such events need to be first absorbed and understood for models to be generated. Online dynamic network data can be discrete or continuous. Changes to the network can occur either in fits or spurts or gradually over time, and this applies to the rate of incoming data as well. A real-time animation strategy can do a great job of showing events too close to real-time, but it runs in a risk of potentially overwhelming the user when there's too much data coming in. And static representation, if not properly managed, would create numerous time steps for every little change to the network. An alternative strategy is the concept of binning, which is grouping a set of events together and animating them at the same time. The issue comes with what threshold to use, event or time. In this work, we explore both event, time, and our hybrid approach. That's a combination of the two. Analyzing changes to the dynamic network in real time involves two kinds of tasks. Monitoring, where the analyst needs to become aware of a particular change as soon as it occurs, for instance, when a node or a cluster appears. Comprehension, where analysis needs to understand what change have occurred over a period of time. For example, what happened to a node or a cluster. From the related work, it's clear a trade-off needs to occur between awareness, that is the user being aware of the change that occurred in the network, with not overwhelming them with too much data. To design a good staged animation representation, we believe a balance of three aspects needs to be achieved. Timeliness, the animation re representation of the event should occur as close to possible to the actual time of the event. And mental map preservation, the animated representation should occur in a way that allows viewers to track changes to the network, thus preserving the mental map of the graph. And minimize transition time. The animated transition should be short enough to make effective use of the viewer's short-term memory in recalling the changes in the graph. Our animated transition is based off of Botch et al's graph diary work, where they first delete entities, nodes and edges, then move all remaining entities, and finally add entities. Uh, this process takes two seconds, with 450 milliseconds for both delete and add, and then 600 to, to move the entities. To discuss the different staging areas, I think it's important to have an example. Here on the left, we can see the starting state of the network and on the right end state of the network. Orange represents the uh, node deletions and edge deletions. Blue represents node additions and edge additions. On the right side, you can see the numbers. Those are the order that the events occur in. 
The first strategy we're going to be talking about today is time-based staging. This uses a fixed interval for its threshold. The, the threshold we use is two seconds, which is the duration of the animation. Looking at this example here, you can see the first four events fall within the first threshold. As stage one is running, another six more events appear, and that is what stage two runs. And lastly, there are three more events that appear, and that's stage three. As you can see, this is great for maintaining timeliness, as the worst case for the time when an event occurs versus when it's shown to the user is two seconds. But the issue with this is there is no limit to how many events will be displayed at any one time. So if a large amount of data comes in at the same time, all those events will be shown at the same time, therefore potentially confusing the user. The next strategy we're going to talk about is event-based staging. This uses a threshold of a number of events. We use five events, as studies have shown, that an individual can track up to five objects moving independently. So here, if we look at our example again, when the first five events have accumulated, staging one is triggered. While that animation is playing, another five events have grouped up and stage two starts. And you can see there's a slight delay between the 10th one and when stage two occurs. Lastly, you don't, there is no stage three, as there's only three events occurred, not enough to cause the trigger to occur. So the advantage of this method is it never overwhelms the user because the number of events is always kept at a manageable amount. The issue you can see is twofold. One, staging can start getting lagging behind as more and more the data that comes in, it'll take more and more animation cycles to show the information. And second of all, due to the five threshold, some events might not appear until much later when enough events have accumulated for the trigger to occur. And the last strategy we're going to be talking about is hybrid staging. This one takes advantage of both event thresholding and time thresholding. But let's look at the example. So when the first five event events accumulate, we start stage one animation. But as you notice, there's something missing. Due to the fact that there was no deletions, hybrid staging actually removes that part of the animation, allowing it to be much faster than event-based. And then the next set of five events accumulate, and then we get to stage two, and lastly, stage three occurs when triggered by time threshold. As we can see, this fixes the event issue of the last three not being displayed, and also speeds up the potential animation. To the caveat, it might cause a little bit more confusion because there's not a clear delineation of the different stages. Both hybrid and event-based still have the same issue of potentially of too much data coming in and there being a longer delay between when an event actually occurred and when the user gets to see it. The purpose of the user study is to determine the suitability of each staging strategy. The tasks are split up into two categories based off of Andrigo's task format. Monitoring and comprehension, which is sound familiar as we discuss those are tasks for online dynamic uh, networks. It was a within subject test with three staging times five tasks. Three tasks were monitoring and two were comprehension. We also did a follow-up qualitative study uh, with two individuals, I think allowed, but due to the time constraints, we'll not be discussing them here. Please check out the paper for more information. Our study had 21 participants with varying backgrounds. Most of them were familiar with information visualization, and eight had prior background in working with known link diagrams. The study was conducted with 16 individuals in person using a MacBook Pro connected to a 13 inch display. Five were remote with a 15 inch laptop. They were shown video clips with no playback option and then asked to fill out a questionnaire afterwards. The dataset we used for the study was the MIT Reality dataset. It followed 100 individuals over one academic year. And it's a quite rich dataset with multiple networks. We used two of them called the proximity network, which is when two phones are within Bluetooth range of each other. It's considered a connection and a phone call when one individual calls another. To make sure we had a good distribution of tasks, we map number of events on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. And you can see here for all five tasks, they have a very different profile and pattern. Noting that, for instance, task one has a, a period at the end where very little data comes in. And like task five, where well, there's uh, spurts of data coming in at regular intervals. For the study, our hypothesis is broken up into three parts, H1, the volume of data affects participants' response time for monitoring tasks. We expect that event-based and hybrid will be quicker than time-based. For H2A, more errors with time-based for comprehension. We think this is due to the increased visual complexity that might occur with a lot of data coming in at one time. 
for H2B, more errors with event-based for comprehension, and this is due to when there's low amount of data, a uh, skew of when it actually occurred versus when it will appear. For H3A, lower levels of performance and higher levels of frustration when it comes to time base, again, due to that visual complexity. And lastly, H3B, higher levels of mental, physical, temporal, and effort in time-based. Moving on to the results section, we actually broke it down based on the types of tasks, starting off with monitoring. If you're interested in what the tasks were, you can see on the bottom right here. We did a, a repeated measure ANOVA, and we did find a significant effect for tasks one and three, but no difference for tasks two. So this is partially confirming H1. Uh, we ran post hoc Tuki, and we did find pairwise significant effects for task one versus event versus time. And then for task three, we found event and hybrid versus time. For comprehension, which you can find what the tasks were on the right, we analyzed the distribution of correct and incorrect responses for each question using Trichorinsky's Q test. Though there is an increase in correctness in task four for hybrid, it's not significantly different. We found no differences in response correctness between conditions for task four and five therefore rejecting uh, H2A and BA. For the questionnaire, which you can find the distribution on the right side, we ran NASA's TLX. We found significant difference for all but performance. Running post hoc, uh, we found there was more frustration with time-based. There was also a higher uh, mental, physical, and temporal load, including effort for time-based. What's interesting is that we did find difference between hybrid and event for everything but mental load and hybrid uh, was better for temporal load but everything else it performed worse other than conducting two studies we explore the scalability effects of each animation strategy by varying the number of events and the time interval which they occur it would be unrealistic to conduct a user study with so many variables and therefore we run a simulation instead we vary the volume from one to ten events at a time which we found on the y-axis and the time interval, which the chunks of events occur from one, eight seconds to the one hundredth of a second, which can be found on the x-axis. The dashed line represents the two-second mark, which is the, the rate of the animation. Um, the event and hybrid were five uh, events at a time, just like it was conducted in the study. As you can notice, the top one is colored differently than the, than the bottom two. That's because the top one is not based off of delay, but based off of how many uh, events are happening for each animation cycle. So exploring time-based, we can see that there's this horizontal set of lines, which is dictated based on how many events. So if there's more and more events, like somewhere around 10, it would be harder, presumably for an individual to be able to see the whole pattern. Once we hit that two second mark, we get a, what's called a staircase effect, where as the number of events increases or the interval decreases, then it becomes more and more presumably difficult to see all the set of events. Now, if we explore event-based, we can see that we do not have that horizontal line, but we do get the staircase effects and it occurs beforehand. The color here indicates, by the way, delay. So 100% would be two times the delay. What's interesting also in event-based, you can see on the bottom left, there is a accumulation of also delay. And that occurs from the fact that uh, you need at least five events before the trigger occurs. So if it takes uh, eight seconds for one event, it would take up to 40 seconds before you saw those five events then pl uh, flash. For hybrid, you can see that it does not have the same issues as event and only maintains the staircase of when there's too much data coming in to deal with it. Through our study, we learned that regardless of monitoring and comprehension tasks, animation staging strategies that prioritize comprehension do better for participants response time accuracy and comfort yet the difference between these staging areas are slightly blurred for tasks that are less complex or require less monitoring time our hybrid strategy is a combination of parameters used from time-based and event-based but it is relatively simple there's more that could be done here having varied time and event thresholds or bundling movements so we can push against that five limit other potential uses for this is the idea of capturing states. Instead of having a state for every single change, you can bundle the states, and this will be great for static small multiples for post-analysis. Lastly, we want to create an application with hybrid strategy to see what the effects of the technique is when bundled with other approaches and what benefits can be gained from using this kind of technique.
All right. Thanks, Tariq, for the wonderful talk. So in your future work, you mentioned about applications with these hybrid strategies. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that point? Hi. Yeah, so I was thinking more along with the uh, ability adaptive. So instead of having a fixed set of linked, uh, it's always five events or always a certain amount of accumulation, that would vary based on the data. So if the data, we know the data coming in is going to be less, then we change the strategy about. Um, the other thing is that limitation of five events at a time. Um, that study is about five individual events. I don't know what that happens when it comes to these different phases. Does that mean we can have five ads, five removes, and five movements? And that technically could push against that wall. So that's another thing I would want to test out. And the concept of that, as I mentioned, bundling movements in, in hybrid. If a cluster appears at the same time, can I show all of that? Or can I only show five of those at the time at those limits? So there's a comment from the audience I just read it aloud. So this reminds me of central long um, discussion of calligraphy about class intervals, like equal intervals, equal call size, and hybrid. And there are also many other methods designed in calligraphy. Maybe you can want maybe you want to check that. Okay. All right. So uh, if there's no further question pop up, um, let's uh, move on to our next paper, uh, which is titled Analyzing Dynamic Hypergraph with Parallel Aggregated Ordered Hypergraph Representation, which will be presented by Paula. My name is Paola Valdivia, and I will present our work, Analyzing Dynamic Hypergraphs with Parallel Aggregated Order Hypergraph Visualization. This is in collaboration with Paolo Buono, Catherine Plesson, Nicole Dufourneau, and Jean-Daniel Piquet. So, what is a hypergraph? A hypergraph is a generalization of a graph where links can connect any number of nodes. And how is it different from a normal graph? Why do they need a special visualization? Let's see how can we represent a who knows who graph using a no link diagram. In this normal graph, we have four people and we have an edge if two people know each other. We see that everybody knows everybody else. Now, let's look at the hypergraph. Nodes are the same four people, but now each hyper edge represents an article. The first one was written by Catherine and Jean Daniel. The second one by Catherine and Paolo. And a third one and a fourth. Sadly, it looks exactly the same as the who knows who graph. So how can we reveal hyper edges? One approach will be to use a different color for each article or we can represent articles as sets. Now, you can imagine that with a higher number of authors and articles, we could easily run out of colors. The representation will start to look flatter and making sense of the visualization will become challenging. Another way of visualizing hypergraphs is by using a bipartite network, where a different encoding is used for each type of node. In this case, the nodes are authors and articles. But let's now describe our proposed technique to visualize hypergraphs. And later we'll see what is the advantage over the other representations. Firstly, we align all authors' names to the left and represent each article as a vertical line. We add a dot in to indicate that the person is a co-author of this article. For example, this article has Catherine and Paolo as co-authors. We have two more hyper edges to represent the other articles. And now we have represented the four articles without overlapping. And we can then examine connections between all co-authors. Even more, assuming all of these articles were published in the same year, we can group them in a time slot called time one. And we can add more time slots next to this one to represent a dynamic hypergraph. Using our representation called PowerVis, we can analyze in detail connections and changes in the co-authorship relations over time. Let's see now a case study to see how we can use PowerVis to analyze a dynamic hypergraph. This case study was led by Nicole, a French historian. 
She is interested in analyzing the role of a merchant, Marie Boucher. There is no historical information about Marie Boucher, but she is mentioned in 59 legal documents from the 16th and 17th century. The dataset of Marie Boucher was collected, processed and analyzed by Nicole. We will see how she performed her analysis and how she can perform the same analysis using Paubis. But first, this is an example of a legal document of the 17th century. The historian needs to extract the information and process it to be able to have a clean dataset that can be used by computer tools. As you can imagine, this is a long and complicated process that produces medium-sized networks of about 200 nodes. After that, the historian performs a long, careful and detailed analysis on this dataset. The historian had already analyzed her dataset with the help of two representations. The first one was a bipartite graph where she can see the connections between documents and persons, but no temporal information. The second representation was a time arcs visualization made in the online tool, the Vistorian, where she can see the connections between pairs of persons over time, but the document information is lost. That means she cannot tell if two arcs represent the same document. Using PAOVIS, she has the list of merchants at the left, and she can see each document, the detail of who was mentioned in each document, and the temporal information. In this case, each time slot represents a year. Let's go back to understand how PAOVIS worked with a simplified example. In this example, the user colored the nodes by family and selected the first node. The user sees that there are two families, Colleen and Dos Santos, and they can further see that Elise has connections with all of the 13 people in this dataset, and then she is mentioned in 14 out of 19 documents. Okay, now let's go back to our case study. In this dataset, we see that there are 59 documents represented by the hyper edges. These documents correspond to a 22 year period. We have 181 people, where only 38 that appear in more than one document are listed. The other 143 people are hinted as drips, which are those smaller circles. When we hover over the hyper edge, all the names appear so users can explore in detail who appears in each document. So, as I said, in the past, the historian has used this time arc representation to explore the connections between persons. But the information of each document was lost. So she made the assumption that two persons connected the same year appear only in one contract. However, using Paovis, she discovered that there were multiple documents involving these people in the same year. In the end, the same analysis can be done more accurately using Paovis. Another thing that she observed was that the previously identified stages in the merchant life of Marie Boucher are pretty evident using Paovis. As she observed, at the beginning, Marie Boucher had only business in France. Later, she started transatlantic business and her third period was an expansion phase, when she associated with Huber and Tom to form the Marie Boucher and Huber and Tom company. In her words, this is a tool to verify a hypothesis. It gives ideas and structured thoughts. It provides narrative support and is a useful communication tool. Now, let's look at some useful interaction techniques implemented in Pauvis. We can highlight, select and filter edges. By clicking on Marie Boucher, I select her and filter the edges to see only Marie Boucher connections. I can reorder the nodes using different strategies. By default, the names are ordered chronologically, which means that people who appear in the earliest documents appear on the top of the list. Or we can order by group. In this case, people from the same family are grouped together. 
The option of showing group names on the left allows us to edit the names and also collapse the groups to see connections between groups. Like in this case, the interaction between the two families is clearly shown. Notice that each aggregated hyperedge remains a hyperedge. To identify usability problems, gather feedback, and improve POVs, we performed a usability study with nine participants. It consisted of two phases, discovery and task phase, each one lasting around 20 minutes. During the discovery phase, participants received no training and were asked to describe what they were seeing, and then they were asked to freely interact with POVs. After that, they performed six tasks and provided feedback and suggestions. After each participant, we fix the usability issues. During the discovery phase, we use a small co-authorship network from the ILDA team. At the beginning, we did not give access to the interactive features. Still, participants figure out the layout without training. After they could use interaction, they all understood the color coding and that drips represented filter out authors. An example of problems we noted and fixed was that the terms vertex and hyperedge were confusing, so we replaced them by custom terms loaded with each dataset. For example, instead of vertex, we say author. Instead of hyperedge, we say publication. Some participants were lost after filtering, so we added a simple animation to clarify what was being filtered out. For the second test phase, we use a larger co-authorship network with 20 semesters of the publications of the AVIS and the ILDA team. To give an example, the third task was, looking at Petra's network, are there papers with the exact same co-authors in different semesters? Tell me the names. One of the participants' approach to solve this task was to first locate Petra and then filter out her network. After that, the participant highlighted similar edges approaching the cursor to each line. Like in this case, all edges which include Petra and Tobias Eisenberg, Michael Sedlmayer, Thorsten Muller and Jan Shen are highlighted, which is a possible answer to this task. In fact, the possibility of highlighting similar edges was added after the fifth participant and was used by three of the remaining four participants. In summary, Participants were able to interpret basic features of POVs with no training. More complex features need some training, for example with video demonstrations. It was also interesting that participants liked the filtering feature because it reduced clutter, which is coherent with our intuition that POVs is good to analyze small networks in great detail. To conclude, POVs allows to display dynamic hypergraphs with no overlap or crossings, making it very readable. POVs shines with mid-size graphs and allows detailed analysis. Drips and filters go a long way to deal with larger datasets, but compacting and grouping helps to scale further. So what's next for POVs? Clustering is important to our users. That's why we developed an approach for clustering that is presented in a VAS session. We will continue to develop POVs and add features that are useful for our collaborators, mostly social scientists. Next steps include, for example, highlighting differences between time slots, visually encode node and hyperedge attributes, and dynamic clustering. POVs is available at this address. Thank you. Thanks, Paula, for the talk. So I call the comments from the audience. Very nice, uh, clean design. So here's a question from the Discord channel. Does the tool support capturing of insights by historians? Uh, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, sadly, for now, we don't support annotations. That would be great. 
Uh, we are always working with uh, historians and sociologists and trying to help them in their work. So that would be like certainly a very useful feature. But so what we support and is very useful for them is that uh, you, with this static visualization, they can print it and they can analyze it like in paper. Uh, so they like that very much. Yeah. So here's another comment from the audience. So this, uh, this, uh, this technique is actually used for set visualization. So it's my similar to uh, 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 upset, uh, if you're familiar with the work. So could you explain that? What What's the difference there? Yes, yeah, so the, the, yeah, the, the technique for upset is uh, clearly made for sets. So they support like different features that, for example, in, in intersection union of sets. It's similar, but there is like visually, yes, visually is very similar, but there are like uh, semantically there is a huge difference. For example, we try to load a data set uh, with the papers and like the system will try to compute all the int intersections. So it's, it does not scale for, for like a large data set and, and even less for like a dynamic uh, hypergraph. Cool. There are still more comments coming up, but we have to keep going. Thanks very much, uh, Paula. So, our last paper in this session is Visual Analytics for Temporal Hypergraph Model Exploration, which will be presented by Max. Everyone, I'm Max, a PhD candidate at Daniel Kimes Data Analysis and Visualization Group at the University of Konstanz, where I'm working at the intersection of data visualization and machine learning to enhance multi-scale visual pattern exploration for hypergraphs. Today, I'm going to present Hypermatrix, a visual analytics technique to explore temporal hypergraph models. Different industries generate large amounts of data every day. Much of this data describes processes, which can be represented and modeled using graphs. However, simple graphs often do not reflect the complex underlying structure adequately and are hard to visually interpret. Changing relationships inside the data mean that often the temporal aspects cannot be ignored. Further, the complex nature of the data means that using hypergraphs instead of graphs for modeling helps to more precisely describe the underlying problem structure. This is why many problems from diverse areas benefit from a modeling as temporal hypergraphs. But even when we have such a temporal hypergraph model, the question arises how we can explore such a model, search for patterns, or even refine the model itself. To improve upon existing approaches and provide a generic solution, we propose a new technique which combines a new visualization method with a deep learning approach while including expert knowledge. Especially for non-standard search tasks, automatic analysis of ill-defined problems is still very limited. We propose a method that leverages expert knowledge not only through the traditional visual interaction, but also enable experts to interact with the deep learning model itself, introducing their additional domain knowledge iteratively during exploration and thereby refining and retraining the machine learning model itself through rapid iterative feedback. We call this technique hypermatrix. In the following, we demonstrate its central concepts and aspects. As the technique is generic, it requires domain adaptions. In our paper, we have described one such adaption using a real-world communication prediction use case from criminal investigations as driving example. There, the goal is to predict future conversation topics based on historical data. For the presentation, we refer to this use case and the accompanying prototype, but keep in mind that different domain adaptions might require slightly different solutions in domain-specific visualizations. We start with the raw communication data. Standard NLP methods are used to extract conversation topics for individual users. These topic user combinations are then used to build a temporal hypergraph model. This can be done using a geometric deep learning approach and a semi-supervised learning setup. We have described the relevant details in two previous publications. The principal idea is to have a hypergraph link prediction model, HGDL, taking as input the incidence matrix I at time t, 
and a Laplacian to learn the best parameter set phi for predicting the incidence matrix I at time t plus 1. The steps we have now taken, compared to previous research, is to add a relevance feedback approach to the model. The enhanced prediction is then based on the original model, together with the new incorporated feedback F. To achieve much faster convergence, we additionally use the learned parameters phi as initialization. This concept allows for an interactive retraining of the deep learning model. The integration of additional domain expert knowledge in the actual machine learning model itself, and the tracking of the model evolution in response to the feedback. This allows experts to refine complex models interactively. When we look at the workflow, the model is consequently enhanced with a feedback loop, allowing to integrate implicit knowledge on the fly. To work interactively with such a model, the expert needs to know what it actually looks like. For this, we introduce a novel multi-level hypergraph visualization. Here we show the main interface. The data you see is obfuscated but aligned with the original right-wing and terrorist investigation data from the use case. We want to warn viewers that some of the terms displayed contain offensive language. The visualization is shown in area A. It uses a multi-level matrix-like approach to visualize the hypergraph. Nodes are shown on the left hyperedges on top, and the color of the cell entries indicates the containing nodes within the hyperedge. For example, the red colored area represents one hyperedge, which connects four different nodes. This means these four users talk about a topic associated with this hyperedge. The visualization contains six different levels, which are shown as insets. Currently, the whole visualization is at level two. The idea behind different visualization levels is that the expert can concentrate on different aspects of the model, similar to a semantic zoom. Level 1 only shows binary connectivity information. When zooming in, level 2 adds gradual connection strength. Starting at level 3, an error of time is shown, displaying a temporal change of the model. In our case, it shows the historic and predicted amount of communication that a single user talks about a specific topic. The head of the arrow represents the future predictions. At level 4, the visual encoding is supplemented by a positional encoding using a line chart. At level 5, the visualization shifts from the meta information to the conversations. It shows a high level overview of the raw data using keywords. In the final level 6, the actual text content is shown on which the deep learning model bases its predictions. Now I think, for a better understanding, it is best to see this in action. During the exploration, matrix reordering techniques allow for intelligent sorting, independently per axis, which supports capturing clusters in the data more easily. The visualization offers to describe multiple levels where the analysis shifts between a detection of change, amount, keywords, which offer an abstract representation of the content. This content can be studied by the domain experts to confirm their conclusions. To further align the mental model of the expert with the visualization, we offer several techniques. This includes traditional concepts like sticky elements, highlighting and search, among others. A more advanced concept we designed is the arbitrary and nested grouping of nodes and edges into meta-concepts by selecting and merging entries for already created concepts. This allows experts to transfer their mental compartmentalization to the system to better reflect their understanding of the model. This mental clustering can also be explored further if desired, using a hierarchical representation over multiple levels. Looking again at the workflow and fast-forwarding to the complete version, we leave out some details which can be found in the paper. In the following part, we want to focus more on the last aspect, the relevance feedback and domain knowledge integration loop. We have discussed the introduction of feedback into the model itself before, but now how can an expert give feedback from within the visualization? This happens with the main visualization interface. In the middle, you can already see the area labeled D, which shows the domain knowledge integration and feedback process. The ripples going out from a single changed cell 
indicate that this atomic change propagates throughout the whole model and leads to non-local transitions. We describe this with an example. The expert starts by selecting a cell which requires updating, for example, when it's known that this user communicated about a topic but might have used some different words so the model did not recognize it. To then better support the understanding of the change in the overall model, we feature an integrated model update visualization. The expert can either decide to reject the proposed changes, or the model implications can be interactively explored, which makes individual changes traceable. During this process, it's possible to change between different levels, which further allows to prove or disprove a conclusion. Individual details can be explored carefully and checked to match the expectations. If the expert is satisfied, the changes can be accepted and then the updated model is shown again and the analysis loop goes on. Now, to better understand the benefits of our approach, we conducted an extensive evaluation. We described the use case and did a detailed comparison with the state of the art. We showed that our technique improves upon scalability by a factor of about 10 to 30, provides a generic solution which increases wide applicability and for the first time allows for the seamless integration of domain knowledge in a hypergraph model by reducing media discontinuity. A formative user study with three communication analysis experts eval evaluated the usability of hypermatrix. It showed that hypermatrix is easy to use yet powerful. All the experts were able to explore, search, and refine the model. According to the experts, our technique allows them to explore large datasets in less time while leveraging all the knowledge which is available, without resorting to sticky notes next to their screen. We found that a human-in-the-loop approach can be beneficial, as it leads to an increased understanding of the experts and allows for the contribution of domain knowledge, which would be hard to formalize a priori. Of course, our technique can be improved further. For example, in terms of scalability, the main issue is the visualization. Here we imagine a concept of multiple magic lenses that can be used to better use the available screen space. One other important aspect is the realization of different domain adaptions, for example in biology or political sciences, including domain-specific visualizations for the, for the lower levels. Another aspect we can improve upon is the way domain knowledge is added to per cell, so going away from the numeric input to more category-based solutions. The last aspect I want to mention is the enhancement of the change visualization. Currently we show only the change in each step for performance reasons. But in principle it would be possible to calculate the influence of each input at every modification and then show for example areas of the model which will be volatile for predictions which can be traced back to single changes. So in summary, this has been Hypermatrix. It enables users to explore and refine temporal hypergraph models. By tackling the visualization of temporal hypergraphs and iterative model refinement and allowing experts to explore model applications and to integrate their domain knowledge. If you want to find out more, write to us or visit our website on bit.ly hyper minus matrix minus this. Thank you very much for the, for the talk, Max. So it's a wonderful paper. Here's a, a question. So in your future work, you mentioned about adaptive techniques to different applications. So what kind of change uh, would be required to adapt these techniques? Yeah, so there basically would be two types of changes. On the one part, you would have to change the underlying machine learning model. So switch out a um, dramatic deep learning model adapted maybe, depending on what kind of your domain you're going into. Mm -hmm. And the second part would be the visualization. And that also depends what kind of adaptions you would do. Um, in our use case so far, we focused on text analysis. So you could likely reuse some of the aspects there. 
but maybe when you're going to biology or molecule analysis there, it might be a good idea to change some of the lower level visualizations, for example, to visual representation of molecule or something like that. Cool. Yeah, so I think this techniques is very uh, handy and in time, especially during this phase, we have a lot of online communication. So a uh, related question. So how can this, uh, this approach benefit the analysis of uh, say communication prediction models or communication analysis in general? So one of the problems in communication analysis is that um, often you use graphs and then when you use graphs, you cannot capture the whole dynamics of the communication. And that's one, I, one reason why hypergraphs are better suited for modeling to such of kind of complex communications. And the second part is when you model that, um, people who analyze this, they often are not experts in graphs or hypergraphs. So you would need a system which helps them to communicate with the, with the model they have and maybe do that not only um, by doing mathematical formulations, but also doing it interactively and easily. And so they can really introduce their domain knowledge and not resort to some sticky notes next to their desk or um, some parameters they um, would need to remember and cannot reflect in a model. And that's one um, way the um, system can help with that. Cool. Thank you. So uh, I, I guess that's conclude uh, the session. Hope you enjoy this dynamic graph and hypergraph session. Let's uh, thank all the speakers, give them virtual applaud. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you for watching. We present the visualizations for the RAID-C AD simulation ensemble available on the Cybis Contest 2020 website to analyze the commonalities and differences in the AD features observed across the ensemble members. Specifically, we demonstrate the applications of statistical visualization techniques in the context of volume rendering, mass complexes, and isocontus to gain insight into the potential AD positions and their special uncertainty for the ensemble. Visual data analysis of large amounts of data demanded solution which provides users the means to enter into the dialogue with the information visualization. To understand how multimodal interaction using touch speech and middle hand gestures can tackle this gap, we conducted an explorative interaction elicitation study. We argue that users are highly receptive to use multimodal interaction for visual data analysis and that especially the combination of touch and speech would be promising due to their complementary in nature. We present three external labeling concepts that allow a user to browse through point sets without the need of zooming in and out. In the first method, labels are distributed on multiple pages. The next method arranges the labels in a single row that can be continuously slid along the bottom side of the map. In our third method, labels are distributed on stacks which a user can independently browse through. We propose a method palette that fully automates the coloring process of categorical data and produces discriminable results. Based on both color and data spaces, our method incorporates three scoring functions into a customized simulated annealing algorithm. We apply our method to different types of visualizations and compare it with the state-of-the-art palettes through a controlled user study. We present Uplift, a system that supports casual collaborative visual analytics in the domain of smart grid technologies. We applied a co-design approach to design, implement, and evaluate Uplift with experts in energy systems and members of the Monash Microgrid project. Uplift uses embedded data visualization to show energy data for each campus building. This study proposes a taxonomy of sentiment data visualization based on visual metaphors. In order to create a taxonomy, we enhanced a group of classification criteria. And then, we classified a total of 35 papers published in the last 20 years. As a result, we presented the guidelines for researchers doing research on the sentiment visualization and visual metaphors.
Functional safety analysis is an automotive systems engineering technique that helps minimize unreasonable risks associated with automotive, electronic, and electrical systems. We developed a visual analysis tool, Safety Lens, to assist domain experts to perform exploratory analysis of a single project as well as comparative analysis among multiple projects. In this study, we designed pass visa to fully analyze the passing dynamics. Users can hover on a pattern diagram to see all the passing patterns, it is the characteristics, and how these patterns distributed over phases. They can further click on a pattern to see its phases, select one phase to see the passing, and inspect the prior statistics during passing. Designed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the novel visualization technique we are calling GOWNS accommodates continuously incoming and increasing case data without distorting past data. Layering linear scale graphs shows both small and large numbers. This allows more detail to be seen when scrubbing through time and comparing regions by realigning the GOWNS based on case numbers. Ensuring the usability of a dataset is often tied to data wrangling. We can use provenance to log the employed steps, but these alone will not give us meaningful insights if data quality was improved. We propose to incorporate data quality metrics into the provenance model. The enhanced provenance graph can be visualized to show the development of quality throughout the wrangling process. To find out more about the visualization design and the results of our evaluation, please join us during the live presentation and discussion session. We propose V2V, a comprehensive pipeline for variable selection and translation for multivariate time-varying data. Our approach contains feature learning, translation graph construction, and variable selection. To demonstrate the effectiveness of our approach, we compare histogram matching, pixel to pixel, and CycleGAN to evaluate variable translation. In addition, we also compare an information-aware framework to evaluate variable selection. Mode surfaces are the generalization of degenerate curves and neutral surfaces. In this paper, we provide novel analysis on the topological structures of mode surfaces. This allows us to not only better understand the structures in mode surfaces and their interactions with degenerate curves and neutral surfaces, but also develop an efficient algorithm to seamlessly extract mode surfaces. We apply our analysis and visualization to a number of solid mechanics data sets. This study presents a method to explore hierarchical data by improving RodViz, one of the visualization techniques for multidimensional data. The user can set options for nodes and check the data in groups or individually in the RodViz. Three subviews at the right enable the hierarchical clustering structures of selected data and allow the user to grasp the features of selected data. As a result, this system allows more detailed insight into the data while solving the node overlapping problem. Typical ink displays are in black and white. With the absence of color, we explored texture encoding as an effective way to visualize data. Inspired by existing practice, we summarized black and white texture properties, which can be used to encode data. We developed a prototype of a design tool that can customize black and white textures by manipulating these properties. We present VRIA, a web-based framework for creating immersive analytics experiences in VR, built upon popular web technologies and enabling the implementation of VR experiences in a web browser, accessible on many platforms. VRIA offers a visualization creation workflow for different levels of expertise using a bespoke builder tool, a declarative grammar, and an API for extensibility. We present a series of use cases along with considerations on performance, scalability, and lessons learned. See you in our talk. We present an exploration into co-located collaborative immersive analytics in a prototype called Fiesta, the free-roaming immersive environment to support team-based analysis. The prototype allows groups of users to visualize and explore their data in a room-scale environment, which we used in an exploratory study involving 10 groups of 3 participants. We focus on the roles which 2D surfaces have, as well as how users leverage the 3D space during both the individual and collaborative work.
existing visualization tools for deep learning classification are mostly working on natural images with mutually exclusive classes. The classification of X-ray scattering images is more challenging since their multiple structural attributes have complex relationships. So, we built an effective visualization system to study the model performance and to find questionable labels or outlier images for scientists' further improvement. Classroom participation data disaggregated by race and gender can enable teachers to reflect on their implicit biases and consciously enforce participatory equity in their classrooms. In this work, we explore a design space for representing classroom data to enable teachers to compare contributions across students and student groups, as well as compare participation rates of the different student groups with their demographic compositions. When NASA engineers plan a mission, they turn to space trajectory designers to chart a path that minimizes the need for propellant mass. In this work, we applied a topological analysis of the circular restricted three-body problem to space trajectory design. And demonstrate the benefit of this approach to devise compelling solutions to realistic trajectory design problems. In our talk, we will introduce a didactic methodology for craft 